What's going on guys, it's Sadiq Davies. Welcome to The Network. What most of you guys don't know is The Network is a podcast where I sit down with individuals who are doing big things in their field or in their industry, who has a net worth of half a million dollars or more or a million dollars or more, right? These are individuals that understand the game and who's willing to share their to share their knowledge, their expertise, and you know how they got to where they're at. But with their success comes with a lot of highs, a lot of lows, you know, and a lot of failures and a lot of and a lot of uh, success behind it all. So on this first episode of the network, right, this individual that I'm sitting down with, his name is Vincent Mann. Um, he owns Kai Lift Homes. And this guy's been doing this stuff for over a decade now. If I'm correct, you could correct me after Vince, so I apologize. But he's been in the game for a while. He has a net worth of over 10 million. And uh and just because you have a net one thing I want to clarify with a lot of people, right? Is because just be, just because you have a net worth of ten million dollars or a net worth of a million dollars or net worth of a billion dollars, doesn't matter what that looks like, doesn't necessarily mean that you have that cash physically in the bank, all right? Is your net worth to me personally means your sources that you're utilizing to generate revenue to be able to sustain yourself and your family. So with that being said, I would love to introduce the very first guest, um, Vincent Mann, this, once again, this guy's a powerhouse in the industry. Welcome to the platform, the network. Let's go. Introduce yourself, Mr. Vin. Again, how you doing? Um, I'm Vincent Mann, uh, managing member of Kyle Tiff Investing, Investments and Consulting, um, also Kyle Tiff Homes, um, and also Tulsa, Tulsa Capital Funding. Um, All right, cool. So... What do, what do you actually do within your company? So my company is a full service uh, real estate company, which um, does mostly developments, um, fix and flip. Uh, I have a general contracting division and also um, a loan uh, brokering division as well. All right, cool. So you've been in the game for quite some time. How long exactly? About 16 and a half years. Wow, that, that's, a, that's a wow. Uh, now, when you initially came into this game, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily your first taste in the, in, in the real estate game, right? You were venturing in other stuff or how, better yet, let me ask you this. How did you end up diving into the space of real estate? So, I, I mean, within my family, you know, I come from a long line of, uh, entrepreneurs, um, my grandparents, um, you know, aunts, uncles. Um, so, you know, when I was young, for the most part, uh, all my grandparents owned a home um, or they had a small business. You know, I actually had an aunt who actually took me every summer to DC, Washington DC, and um, she exposed me to uh, real estate and um, uh, different types of businesses. And, and that's kind of what kind of was the spark in having me have an interest in real estate. So I've always had an interest. Um, you know, I got into it obviously later, but I've always, was, you know, reading the newspaper, you know, when everybody was reading the newspaper, looking at how much single family houses went, three family houses went. So I was always curious. Um, and, you know, from, from, from a child, you know, I lived in an apartment complex. I was always curious in how much money wh whoever the owner was was making mm -hmm. from from uh, each and every tenant. So that was, you know, that was my my first phase into um, having the mindset of, you know, wanting to be uh, a real estate investor. Gotcha. But you said one one of the things that I heard you mention is that you got into the game at a later time. You know, even though you've always had that that taste for it and mm -hmm. always been there, but you got into it at a later time. What happened that, what happened with Vin that led up to you getting into real estate at such a later time versus earlier, earlier on? 
Well, I mean, I, I being exposed, uh, being around um, the streets, you know, and, and and I wasn't per se a street kid. Like, you know, I came from a, a good family, um, but I, obviously I lived in the city, so I was just around certain individuals, and and certain individuals that was older than me exposed me to to the streets as far as getting into you know selling drugs. So. Um, once I, you know, I got involved in that, you know, ended up getting in trouble as a kid, went to training school, got out of that situation, you know, graduated high school, went to college. When I went to college, I was, it was just more exposure to stuff in the streets. <laughs> you know, I was, you know, in Atlanta, you know, hustling back again. Um, and, you know, coming back, back home, back and forth, doing the same thing. And I ended up getting in trouble going, going to federal prison for about seven years. Yeah, I think a lot, I think what it is that growing up, cause I grew up in the city too, you know, and I think we pretty much grew up in the same city, just different generations, mm -hmm. right? Slightly, uh, you might be slightly older than I am for the most part. And just like you, you know, um, growing up in, in the city there, there were things that we were exposed to, mm -hmm. right? That led us doing things that it's not that we initially wanted to do, but I guess it was a form of survival for the most part. For for an individual like myself, just like you, you you grew up in a decent household. I grew up in a decent household, you know. But growing up in the city and seeing what other dudes are mm -hmm. doing in the game, it gets you caught up, right? Yeah. So I totally get it in terms of that aspect of your story. And I think there's a lot of individuals out there who's in the game, you know, or who serve time and who's trying to find their way out, you know? And for those individuals that's out there, you know, opportunities, opportunities are always there. And it's just all about what you do to try to get yourself Away, subtract yourself away from the things that you're doing to the things that, you know, could put you in a better position in life. Uh, but I want to ask you, when you were down and you were locked up in federal prison, right, um, and you're going through this journey of trying to find yourself, were there any books or anything that you read or anything that created clarity for you, you know, to be able to turn that light bulb on and, uh, you know, be able to move forward accordingly. So as far as with real estate goes and in, in business, the first book that really inspired me um, was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, I think that inspired that, a lot of people. Yeah, that, that book probably changed the game for me mentally. You know, um, you know I'm not, my attention span sometimes is not as good as reading a book. I never can complete a lot of books, but that book, I just breezed right through it. It was an easy read. I just couldn't put it down. You know, I think I read it twice. <laughs> um, so that was the most influential book that I that I read. You know, there was other books I read. I read The Money Machine, which is another real estate um, book. Um, I think I, you know, The Art of the Deal. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, moving forward, I read numerous books, you yeah. know, um, The Richest Man in Babylon really, Very really changed book. my whole perspective as 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 a you know older older man now you get what i'm so, saying so um so th that's kind of like what really kind of changed and i still read i still listen to audio books and i i will say this that's probably the most important thing is is reading you know um because you know it opens your, opens your eyes to a lot of things that you don't really see without reading basically no facts. And I think that even me, an individual like myself, when I was down, I did a lot. There was a lot of times where, like, when you're down, there's nothing else you could do but mm -hmm. read. You know, yeah. if you have some type of artistic ability, you'll draw. Yeah. You know, and for others, it's workout, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, so I totally understand. Um, what was your day to day like when you were down for seven years? Uh, I, I, I would say. Um, my day to day was a lot of conversations. Mm. Um, so, in you what know, sense? I would just talk to any and everybody that um, really would 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 speak about something that I had interest in. And I've always had interest in business. You know, I I always there's a story. You know, when I when I first went in, 
um, I, I, I went to, first I went to like a low security, ended up being transferred to a minimum security. And when I first went, they had TV rooms and I was going to TV room. They had a room with news, they had a room with sports. They had a room with, um, finance, with financial channels like CNN or whatever channels it was back then. And it was just packed with a lot of people that looked like me. Wow. And at first I was frustrated. Why? Cause I wanted to watch Rap City. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I dig it. you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I really was like, what are, what are they, what are, what are you watching the stock yeah. market? I didn't understand it, you know. No um, facts. <laughs> just being honest with you, you yeah. know. So it wasn't until I started to ask questions. Like, you know, I've always been a person to ask questions. So that's been a gift and a curse of mine. That's kind of one of the things where I got involved in the street was asking questions. Yeah. Oh, this is what you can do? Okay, I want to do that. So to get back to that, so that's kind of like my day-to-day -day was I was intrigued and, and, and wanted to understand what it was about the, the stock market. Um, and then after that, when I was speaking to other individuals, they was like, oh, they did this business and tell me about this business. And, you know, and that's after that, it was, you know, obviously you have to work. So between going to work, working out, reading, in, in, in conversations. And that's what kind of taught me how to network more out in the world. Oh. Um, but I, you know, to be honest with you, I was fortunate enough at my age to go to a minimum security, um, facility where I had those options and those people around me, you know, that's I wasn't, dope. you know, a lot of times you can start at a higher security facility in, you don't have those options. It's a whole different ball game. Yeah. You know, I was very fortunate because in, you know, in the federal system, everything is run by cars, by the States, mm -hmm. Rhode Island being the smallest state, you would interact with different people from other States because yeah. we wasn't as big as New York or Facts. Philadelphia or all these places. So I would just talk to certain people and, and then, you know, when they would have classes, I would just go join the classes. They would have certain groups. I would just go talk. Um, excuse me, go, go and listen. Um, and I was just surprised how much knowledge people that looked like me had from other places, you know? Um, and then I, I expanded that to, to meeting different people, um, in other communities in the Jewish community, you know, uh, older, older white guys. And just, you know, we just talk and realize like all of us are kind of the same yeah. is our environments were just very different. And, 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 and the knowledge that we received from our environments was very different, you know. No facts. You know, what, what I'm doing is people's been doing it forever. This is not nothing new. It's just, like I tell people, you're just, we're just not aware yeah. that you can do it. No, and I, I, I agree. And I think one of the, one of the, more, uh, one of the things that I've realized uh, being incarcerated and, uh, you know, just being in the streets is that Believe it or not, most people most people might look at people who grew up in the streets. They might look down on them, right? Mm -hmm. But believe it or not, there's some there are some smart smart dudes that run the street game. Absolutely. If they really took their knowledge, these dudes could really possibly run 500, 500 Fortune type companies. Yes. Right. Because they, um, especially when you're talking about dudes who are making in the millions and stuff like that, like. You can't, whether it's corporate, whether it's street, you know, to generate revenue of a million dollars consistently or mm -hmm. more, you know, that takes intelligence, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Because you, you need to understand how to operate a business and so forth. You know, so I always tell people, believe it or not, there's so many people that's down that I personally wish that they took the opportunity and the time to really apply that energy, you know, building actual corporate companies and running these corporate companies and individuals that actually look like us, yeah. you know what I mean? Doing big things. So like seeing you doing your thing, you know, and being where you're at today, I think that's dope because a lot of us don't have that opportunity B before we allow us turn 25, majority of us are very quick. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We don't see, we don't, we don't live to see past a certain age, you know? So for you to be out here doing your thing, and uh, making power moves. I think that's dope and mad love to you for that. Um, fast forward seven years, you're out, you know, 
And now you try and figure out the game. You try and figure out what my move is, mm-hmm. right? What was your first job that you got into? What was your first job that you did when it came to the real estate industry? Or was, you know? So what, what, what I've always been around older people, always been, I've been being mentored since I was 12 years old, one way or another. Um, so I've always was used to um, being around older people and listening to them. So, you know, when I was away, I, I didn't hang around people my age as much um, just because I was always used to hanging with people older. So when I would talk to uh, different guys about what I wanted to do because we would have investment groups um, and we would talk about it. And, and, you know, there was one dude who we would just always talk and he, and I would say what I want to do and this is not how am I going to do it. And I remember every day you know, was making money on real estate. And this is when I'm reading in the newspaper, I would get the Providence Journal reading the newspaper. Can't believe this is happening. And he would be like, it's still going to be there when you get there. So I was just like, how am I going to really get my way, get my, get in the door. And what he explained to me is like, you got to get in something within the field to get into door, you know? Okay. So, you know, first he was like, you know, you either got to be a real estate agent. Um, but once I looked into it at the time, if you had a record, you couldn't be a real estate agent. You have to be an appraiser, um, um, home inspection, mortgage broker, whatever it is. Just get in there. And once you get inside there, then it's going to open your doors to 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 allow you to do what you want to do. So that was my plan. So when I came home, um, you know, my father actually told me, um, never called the guy. There was a guy here. His name was uh, Bernard Fullen. He actually said, you should go see Bernard Fullen and ask him for a job. So, I, you know, I, I did. He took a meeting. We sat down. We talked. You know, I said, I said, I'll give you a job. You know, it's commission based. Um, there's no salary. You know, what you what you bring in, you, you're going to get paid for. Um, of which that was never a problem with me because even when I had jobs, like I've always done good with commission based jobs, whether, you know, newspaper whatever it is that's just been something i was used to i was within sales my whole life um and i understood that you know at from an early age i understood sales so at the time i was i would i went and asked my probation officer and i said listen this is what i want to do and he's like well you can't do that because it's commission based he said um you can do it but you would have to go get another job that's going to pay your money so i ended up i had another friend um that I, my best friend, who actually uh, set me up with his cousin, who was a manager at Stop and Shop, right. um, and he got me a job overnights, you know, because I, I wanted, I had to do something where it wouldn't affect my hours during the day. Yeah. So you know, I stocked the shelves at Stop and Shop, you know, from eleven to seven, um, and then after that, I would go do mortgages from ten to whatever time I would have to do. Just uh, hustling, hustling. So within that, that's what introduced me to people in the real estate field. You know, that's how I got to know real estate agents, um, attorneys from the attorney. That's when I met my first lender. Um, that's, you know, I would, I would doing mortgages when I, when I was doing mortgage for a person that was buying a house that somebody else was flipping on my own, I would just go buy the house Mm -hmm. and go see the house. And then whoever was doing the work, you own the house. I would start a conversation with them. Um, so that's kind of like how I got, introduced and really got in there. I just was talking to people, you know, and, and just getting to know people. And, you know, steadily, I just realized, you know, I'm in a relationship business. Facts. Everything I just did was in a relationship, you know, yeah. uh, from my father putting me on with Bernard, from my best friend from a childhood putting me on to his cousin, who was a manager from there to meeting this attorney, this attorney set me up with the lender and this and that. So that's kind of how I got into it. And I just built off of that. That's dope. And I think that's why this platform is called The Network, because that's what it really is. It's just a series of individuals they can actually connect with, Mm -hmm. network with, build with, reach out to, and, uh, you know, get what you want out of it. Yeah. Right. Um, What was your experience like as a loan officer during the financial crisis of 2008? How the hell did you manage that? Because I know that was crazy back then. So I think by the time 2008 came, so I was very green. I started doing it in 2006. Um, I was doing okay doing mortgages, which anybody could have did okay doing mortgages back then. So I kind of um, 
once 2008 happened, I was already doing flips. Gotcha. So while I was doing mortgages, I was actively doing flips. So, you know, I, I, I bought a house when I first came home, I bought a house uh, with a stated loan. Um, then I ended up refinancing that house, took some money out, bought another house, flipped that. So my first flip, uh, I made 56,000 um, and also got a buildable lot out of it. Wow, that's what's up. Um, ended up selling a buildable lot to Habitat of Humanity. Um, and then it was just off and running. So it didn't, I was so green by the time 2008 hit, mm -hmm. it didn't affect me like it affected everybody else. I didn't mm -hmm. have the lifestyle everybody else had. Gotcha. I was just really just getting on my feet. Gotcha. It was more or less because the money I was making in mortgages, um, you know, let's just say I made 10,000 in a month or 7,000, whatever. There was people in the company making 50,000 in a month. Jeez. So. I didn't have the fifty thousand dollar lifestyle. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. So when two thousand eight hit, you know, I kind of was pretty good. I still had some stuff that I was obviously, you know, buried in with because obviously the value was tanked. Mm -hmm. um, but but I seen I seen a vision down the line, and I seen more opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one individual that helped me see that opportunity, which who I'm, you know, still, he still mentors me to this day, was he kind of told me, you know, this is where you really stop playing ball. You know, where everybody was just running from it, I was running towards it. So oh. you get what I'm saying? Because of him, I could have did like everybody else does. Everybody was scrambling to get jobs. They wasn't doing real estate, but you know, when I when you have something that was selling for two hundred and fifty thousand. And now it's selling for 30,000, you know, I, I don't, you know, it's not rocket science. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Now it, you had to wait a little while, but stuff was so cheap. Yeah. I kind of was like, I have to uh, take advantage of this. And that was because of him. You know, he kind of told me to renegotiate. I had some private loans with some lenders. I had to renegotiate terms with them mm -hmm. because if I got a loan with you for 200,000 and today it's worth 50,000. We either got to negotiate these terms and we got to wait or unfortunately you can have it back. Mm -hmm. You know, so the integrity inside of me wanted me to keep paying the 200,000. But once I learned what business was like, you got to negotiate. Everybody's negotiating. I can't keep paying you on 200,000 or something that's worth 50. Yeah. So we either got to ride this out together, which you got to bring my rate down. from wherever they're down <laughs> and, and we're going to work this out until the market recovers or if you don't want to do that, you know, respectfully, I just got to say, here, you can take the property back. Mm. Um, so, so, so kind of like that's what 2008 taught me a lot of negotiation skills, um, you know, with banks and lenders. Obviously, you had to do short sales. Um, and, you know, it wasn't easy, but that was the market at the time, you know? Yeah. So, you know, that's what kind of, that's how I made it through. And then I just started flipping what I did have to keep I was buying other stuff so much cheaper it kind of balanced everything out yeah you know so I think my first three family I bought uh, I bought it for 219,000 um that 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 three family I don't think I ever got a short sale done and I believe yeah I did I did lose that one that thing sold on foreclosure for $10,000 Get out of here. Yeah. Damn. It's interesting as you tell as you tell these stories, right? In terms of um going from being a home, being a loan originator, also known as a, a mortgage officer, but in the midst of all that tr surviving, you're flipping homes. And within the OA crisis, you you negotiate either with with a with a hard money lenders right at the mm -hmm. time either to keep the property or take your property back you know what i mean did a, lot, a couple questions one did a lot of the lenders that you're dealing with did they take their property back or were they willing to renegotiate with you the one particular one that that i had most of the loans back took it back um of which you know he was he wasn't happy about it he was mm -hmm. very upset yeah um but guess what? We do business to this day. That's dope. There's no lifelong, you know, 
enemies in business and there's no lifelong friends in business. Facts. You know, once you realize that it's just business, mm. you know, so that's kind of, th- th- that, that was a challenge at first and it was stressful. Um, but once you, you know, once you make it through that and you realize like, you know, it's, it's, this is, this is the hard truth. I can't, I, I can't be the only one getting hurt in this Going thing. through the, going yeah. through the shit. Yeah, yeah exactly. We, we, we're it. all, we're all partners. Yeah. One way or another. I don't care if it's you and the bank, you and a private lender, you and your general contractor, you and your real estate agent, we're all partners. Yeah. If we get to a closing table as you as a real estate agent and something happens with the deal and you know, you're making twenty thousand dollar commission and they want me to reduce a price, you know, I might say, Listen, I need you to take two thousand off the commission so we can get this done. Mm-hmm. To me, in my opinion, a smart real estate agent, let's do it. Let's yeah. let's go ahead and do it. Now, some of them will be like, no, well, the deal's not going to happen. No. You know, so it, the deal just blew up based on a lot of times it's pride and ego mm. versus, you know, let's let's play fair and just make it work. Yeah. And we'll make it up on something else. Facts. You know, so that's 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 just and that, that goes into the relationship aspect of things as well. It's um, one of the things that you mentioned. Um, um, taking a few steps back from your your conversation that I wanted to ask you, but I didn't want to intrude because you would, I want you to share a story. You bought a property that had land on it. Mm-hmm. You caught, uh, you sold the land and was called title. You say something about- I sold it to a Habitat of Humanity. You sold it to Habitat. All right, gotcha. I was, I, I was like, all right, new term. What's this new term yeah. down there? All right, cool. So you, t- you sold it to um, Hab- Habitat uh, Humanity. All right, cool. Was there a reason why? Or were they just well, want the, to buy? Well, the, the, the attorney I was working with basically was already working with them. All right. So the, the, the lender and the attorney. So the lender would do, he would do work for them on projects. So Habitat of Humanity, I, b- I believe it's a nonprofit. And, you know, we, on a Saturday, we yeah. would go help out. You gotcha. know, paint or whatever. They would get all free contractors to get it up and actually put a family inside the inside the home. Gotcha. Um, so I, that that at that time that was that's how that became involved. But um, of which I did do it because I didn't know nothing about subdividing. Mm-hmm. Um, but once that happened, that's what kind of made me realize like when I buy a house, and if it has an extra lot, I could just build another house beside it. Of course. Um, so, but that's how that came about. You know, I, I just didn't know. So at the time, it was like, all right, I'm gonna sell this house. I think I sold it for two hundred and twenty-five thousand or something like that. And they're gonna give me, I think they gave me like twenty-five thousand or something mm-hmm. like that. Twenty fifteen or twenty-five thousand. Remember exactly? Mm-hmm. No, it was fifteen thousand. So it was just like, I'm making money. This is a gimme. You, yeah. you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, that's kind of how that transpired on that particular deal. Gotcha. And in and, and that particular deal, it, it was a blessing. It had to happen because mm-hmm. that's what kept me in the game. You know, I had to have, for me, the person, that person that I am, I had to have that success, Yeah. you know, because that's what made me realize it's real. Because gotcha. I did that in 45 days. Oh, wow. So once I did that in 45 days, everything that I spoke about and read about it it just came to reality Mm. so now it's like okay now i have something here i don't i don't have to try to go back and bust a move or do whatever that 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 was a blessing for me you know and you know challenges came after that but that Mm. first one is what made me stick through and have grit through this whole thing till now till to today that's dope man yeah that's dope now what actually transitioned you from being there's so many pieces that I believe I understand that that I think that led you from transition from a loan officer to a full-time investor. But from your own words, right, specifically, what actually got you to transition from a loan officer to a full-time investor? Well, 2008 happened, so there was no mortgage brokers no more. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Like, that was... So 2008 happened... So obviously I stopped doing mortgages because it was just changing. It wasn't as yeah. easy. People wasn't getting loans, you know. So I was kind of forced into going into being a full-time um, uh, uh, investor in the real estate field. Mm. And then the other thing is regulations happened. So whereas 
you had to have a license to do mortgages. Sure. So I couldn't get a license because I had I had a record. Mm. Um, and at the time, they didn't have, I think today you can get your real estate license if you have a record as long as you're not, it's in the financial um, financial crimes. But at the time, it was just, you know, the sky was falling. You know, you couldn't, it was just tough. It was yeah. just a challenge. So that's kind of why I went full, full throttle into real estate investing. Gotcha. I think that's... I'm not sure if that's where we're at right now, but I know I've noticed that a lot of lenders in the space, in the time that we're at right now with real estate and what's going on economic, economically, there's been a lot of lenders that's been uh, leaving the industry and getting actual jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Regular nine to five, hourly or salary paid jobs. And they've been the same thing for um, real, uh, realtors as well. And I remember I was just talking to one of my lenders and he was like telling me that like he feels like this time is different from the time of 08. You know what I mean? He feel like it's kind of worse than 08. And I never really, I've never operated in the 08 crisis. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm operating in what's going on now. You know, and to me, I'm fit. I heard, I've heard plenty of stories, but I only know what I know. You know, I go and speak upon stories that I w that was told, mm -hmm. you know, but what I know is what I know. And that's where I'm at in the space that I'm in right now, you know, and right now I feel like so far things are just steady. Right. I really haven't felt like I haven't felt like a major crisis yet. I don't know. But have you do you feel like you're feeling the same thing or no? Anybody that's been through 2008, this is nothing. This like is two, nothing. This right? is nothing right, like 2008. Cool, 2008 cool. was a different ball game. <laughs> this is no, yeah, like I, uh, I've ha I have conversations with uh, people all the time on it, and this is not even close, man. For real, three families was going for fifty thousand. Yeah, yeah. You, you get know, what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> it was a short. Like everybody was short selling. Nobody yeah. was paying their mortgage. Damn. Mortgages was adjusting. Yeah. You know you can't. You can't like, I mean, obviously real estate. So I think in like in the past five years, people, a lot of people became real estate agents and they were spoiled. Mm. It was easy. Yeah. You didn't have to work. Yeah. You now know? you got to work. <laughs> now you got to work. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and again, <laughs> you, you can't create a lifestyle for yourself and expect to sustain that lifestyle because things can change when you're commission based. Yeah. Unless you're prepared for it. There's a lot of real estate agents that was prepared. They didn't spend as much money. Yeah. Or they had investments or, or they did this or they kept their jobs. Yeah. There's a lot of real estate agents like <laughs> that was making money as a nurse or whatever. They literally quit their job and became Talk a full time real estate yeah. agent. That wasn't smart to me, mm. you know, because you're gonna you might have to go back unless you prepare yourself for things changing. So now we're in a situation where it's, sac sa it's saturated with a bunch of real estate agents. We're at, you know, a housing crisis. You know, demand is much higher than supply. Yeah. So besides the market changing, there's just not enough real estate to sell. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? No, so, no. you know, everybody's looking for the crisis of 2008. But this is just my opinion when I say this. I think anybody looking for the crisis of 2008 is like somebody older than us looking for the Great Depression to come back. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? No, I get it. I get it. You know, there was, you know, there's people that have interest rates at 2.7% 30-year fixed mortgages. Yeah. It's they're not leaving out. <laughs> they're not leaving. You get what I'm saying? Like that's no, not then, happening no, unless you, unless you were stupid enough to refinance that into like today's interest rate, yeah. which today interest rate is not as high as people think. That's a reality rate. Yeah. You know, somebody getting a mortgage for seven percent. You know, 2007 when I was doing mortgages, you had to have a one credit to get a six and a half percent interest oh, rate. Shit. You know, so yeah. you know back then they was doing eighty twenty loans. Yeah. So whereas eighty percent of your loan was at eight percent, and then twenty percent of the twenty percent of your loan was at seventeen percent, mm. so that blended rate was whatever that came out to be. Was people paying ten percent interest on a loan, nine wow. percent. So that twenty percent, when two thousand eight really really hit, that twenty percent adjusted that mm. twenty percent loan, yeah. and then that's when your payment skyrocketed. So that's what that's how the mortgage crisis happened. Yeah. 
it was too many. And then the state it loans. Mm. We don't we don't have that as much back then. Yeah. Back then, when you when you went and did a mortgage, you can close it in a week, bro. Yeah, I heard I heard crazy. You can start like a mortgage that. on Monday and close. by next Monday you're closing. <laughs> you're closed. Yeah, I heard about that. You're I calling heard. the appraiser yeah. directly. You're doing all these things. Didn't have as much as regulations they have today. Yeah. So when stuff is moving like that fast, yeah. something's bound to happen. Yeah. You know how hard it is to, to when I'm selling houses, people oh we're gonna close in thirty days. That's not happening. Yeah. It's always sixty days. Yeah. I'm happy if it's 45. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Don't let no don't let it be Rhode Island housing. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so I think I think there's been a lot of checks and balances today that they didn't have back then. So I don't not think it's 2008. I just think the 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 market there's a lot of things that are overpriced mm -hmm. and I think we could be heading to a little bit of trouble. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying moving forward now from or from the beginning of the summer, whatever rates went up to like 6%. If they steadily go up to like 8 9%, yeah. I think that could be a problem. But prior to that, mm -hmm. where people have low interest rates, I, I mean, I don't see it. But, you know, I, I'm not, you know. I'm it not, sucks because no anybody that refi or bought a home at a rate of, Four percent under, three percent under. They keeping their home. They're not even. They're not even trying to sell. And I don't, I don't blame yeah, them. Yeah. Why would you, you? I would not blame them whatsoever. And I think that's what's also causing the housing shortage. You know, what I mean, because there's no reason for anybody to sell. Like, what's the point here? You know, what I mean. But it is what it is. Even currently, like, I do agree. With you, agree with you. Like seven percent rate compared to ten, eleven, twelve percent in today's day and age. Shoot, seven percent rate. Get that and run with it. No, I mean six percent. Get that and run with it yeah. because it's better than what it used to be. You know, um, it's just if if you're getting a seven percent rate now, it's because you missed that time where three percent, two percent, four percent was available. You know, it just gotta move with the where where the needle's turning right now. Um, as we're diving, I would like to get to know, or yeah, I would like you to share with us. Um, the inspiration behind the business name car lift this this episode is sponsored by these wings uh located in uh, Pawtucket, rhode island if you guys looking to try some amazing wings some lemon pepper wings some hot spicy wings visit my man these wings in Pawtucket, rhode island it's a taste to die for go check him out investments and I know you mentioned, you already mentioned what services you guys provide, but what's the inspiration behind it? The, the name of the company? Yeah. So the name, the name of the company comes from, you know, uh, a cousin who, who also was a friend and, and um, another person who's also a good friend of mine's um, who both were, were, were murdered um, just being involved in the street. So at the time, uh, both of these these individuals, I didn't. I think I, I think I got to see them like a couple of times before I went away. Um, but they, you know, they was murdered. Like I want to say, like the same year within the six month time frame. I don't know exactly. Um, so you know, when I was inside reflecting, and in, in what am I gonna do and the change in my life? I just went through a transition in my life once that happened. I was like, wow, like. I have to change. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So it was just like, you know, you don't experience, when you experience death at a, at a young age, you know, it changes you one way or another. Yeah. It's, it's, it's going to turn you into some type of animal yeah. one way or another. I, you know, it might be a violent animal or it might be an animal of change. So for me, it was an animal of change and it inspired me to change because I was around these individuals. You get what I'm yeah. saying? Like, in the mix, like, you know, one person, you know, they found him in the refrigerator. You wow. get what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, the, the, the other young lady, um, she was stabbed to death by, you know, a whole bunch of times, you know? So it was just like that, that, that kind of changed my perspective and they wasn't, you know, you know, wild, like super wild in the street. Yeah. You know, I remember, um, it was a Kendrick Lamar's first album was called Good Kid, Mad City. So I, you know, I compared a lot of us as that, you know, we was, you know, we was just good kids, just regular yeah. kids. Obviously we was doing mischievous stuff, but 
um, you know, once, you know, once that happened, it kind of was just like, man, I can't, I can't, you know, continue on doing this. I gotta, you know, it was one of those things, man, I had a slogan, man, remember, love and change. Mm. So I had to remember them, continue to love them. And I had to change. Dope. That was just for me. It wasn't for nobody else. And I took on a purpose because of that. Whereas I have to help people as much as I can who want to receive the help to change. So, you know, one of their names was Kyle and, and, and the other, uh, other young lady, her name was Tiffany. So that's how Kyle Tiff kind of, you know, came hey, together. That's dope. That's dope. How significant is, how significant is mentorship and your pursuit of success in the real estate industry currently? I mean, mentor, mentor, mentorship is probably the most important thing in anything. Um, I, you know, I don't sports, business, the streets, you know, so I would say that's the most important thing because mentorship a lot of times comes from people that's, you know, have already been established, been involved in things. You know, when I speak to somebody um, that's younger than me that want to be involved, I tell them all the time, I tell you about my failures, not my successes. Facts. You get what I'm saying? So that's, so to, to me is, is, is very important. Not everybody is prepared to have a mentor because a lot of people don't want to listen. Mm. But once you, once you, you find the right mentor that you still think is, you know, is cool and you can listen and you can hear them, that changes the game on everything, man. Facts. Facts. No, I agree with you. Um, now in terms of your, uh, properties, your investments, I want to dive into sharing how you really acquired that first property mm -hmm. and how did you find funding to invest in that first property? So my first property I bought, which, is, which was a three family, I was reading the newspaper in work release. Mm -hmm. He said um, work release. <laughs> I was. Um, in... I, I was just calling guys in the newspaper, to be honest with you. Um, for, and, for a lot of y'all youngins out there who don't know what newspaper is, it's actual paper. It's an actual paper <laughs> that we used to read. It's not no phone, no moment, no gadget. Yeah. It's an actual newspaper that we used to read back in the days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I would read the newspaper. I would make calls. You know, I would I'd be taking a bus right downtown, back and forth to work. I'd be reading, call, reading, 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 looking at this guy selling this house. And one, I called one guy, and he was like, "I, I, I got this house on Athea Street. I, I want this price for it." Then I had it, and I went back um, and talked to another guy that was in there with me, that was actually used to be a mortgage broker. He was in work release <laughs> too, and he's the one who actually told me about the mortgage thing. Yep. Prior to my father telling me to go meet with the guy. Um, but not, nah, but he would just talk to me about it. I yeah. figured he was in there for something, something stupid. I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. So he's the one who told me about doing a stated loan and all that. So as soon as I got out, um, my cousin owned a sneaker store. And he said I worked for him. And I, I went and did a stated loan. And then I bought that as a owner-occupant. Gotcha. What's a stated loan, for those who don't Basically, know? Basically, a stated loan is for a lot of people that's self-employed. Um, it was designed for... Uh, bartenders, waitresses, gotcha. strippers, mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. People that didn't claim they was just getting tips and all yeah. this other stuff. Um, but cash it kind of cash. Yeah, people that was getting cash. So yeah. It kind of expanded to a lot of people working under the table. Gotcha. So, you know, um, I did a stated loan on that. Ended up, like, again, I bought that property. It was fully rented. I was collecting collecting the rents and then I think six months down the line, I I did a cash out. From me doing that cash out, I found that flip that I told you, my first mm -hmm. flip. Um, uh, I asked the attorney, because that was another thing I learned when I was the, asking the attorney for lenders. Mm -hmm. I asked the attorney, she hooked me up with a, um, she introduced me to a guy named Keith. Keith went by the deal, like, introduced myself to him. He's like, I do it. He was excited, you know. Gave me all the money That's to buy it. I, I used my money to do the construction. Mm -hmm. I went to um, some guys I knew that did general contracting work mm -hmm. because, again, 
I was me, you know, stopping by a house. They was doing renovations. They was doing their own flips. Yeah. I remember I met them. It was two guys, Brian and Eddie. Um, asked them to renovate the house for me because I didn't have no contacts. Yeah. They went in the house. They was like, yeah, we'll do this house for 30000 They fixed it for 30000 They did it in 30 days. I sold wow. it 15 days later. Wow. No, never, just... you know, never missed a beat. Like, that was the easiest thing ever. So that was my first thing in doing a flip. That's how I went about it, that process, mm -hmm. to do the first one. Now, would you consider, the st uh, was that similar to, like, a hard money loan or no? Well, no, it, it is. there was a hard money All loan. Right. You know, hard money loan... Um, Private money, it's mm -hmm. basically the same thing. It's just they're more equity base than than credit base. Gotcha. You know, um, so yeah. So that's that's that was my first experience with with hard money. Nice. Um, so there's some investors I've listened to investors. I watch a lot of things. or just listen to investors talk. Is a, a lot of them state that or they argue that you don't really need money to enter the real estate business. Um, but I feel otherwise, but I might be wrong. But what's your thoughts on that perspective, though? Well, obviously, you can. There's there's a multitude of things you can do when you first get into the real estate. You mm -hmm. could, you know, you can buy a house and um, partner with somebody. Yeah. You can find a lender that's going to give you all the money. You can um, um, raise capital from certain individuals or whatever. Um, so you can do it without any of your own money yeah. um but you know that that you have to be very like the the deal just has to work has to make sense it has to make sense but you it's like you almost have to be perfect when you have no skin in the game mm -hmm. and you're dealing with other people's money yeah. like you have to be on top of everything because mm -hmm. again it leads back to relationships facts Everybody wants to make money. Everybody wants to invest their money. Mm -hmm. So, but you got to make sure when that happens, like you do everything the correct way because you can lose a lot of relationships by one mistake. Yeah. And it might not be intentional. It just might be, you know, you being super ambitious. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't ever let your ambitions exceed your talents. Gotcha. You know, because um, I've been on both ends. I've been on ends where I you know, raise capital and, and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. But no matter what, they don't, anybody giving their money, if they don't get their money back with a return that they expect, mm -hmm. no matter what the circumstances happen, I don't care if it's 2008, I don't care if it's 2020, they don't care. They're like, you messed up. They're yeah. looking at you as an individual. So that's, you know, that's the thing you got to be careful about if you, if you do something uh, with no money. And it, and everybody just hustles differently, you yeah. know. There's a, there's a there's tons of ways, you know. There's I don't want to say that it never works. I'm just saying you just have to be on top of top of your game. Gotcha. Um, you know, I'd rather if I'm gonna do something with no money, I'd rather do it with a lender that believes in what I'm gonna do. It's like all right, I'm buying this piece of land for fifty thousand. I, I'm going to put a two-family house on there, just keeping numbers simple, for yeah. 300000 Will you give me a loan on a disbursement basis as I go? Mm -hmm. But again, you still need money during that process. Yeah. Now, you, because you got to get the job going. You got to yeah. be able to put the foundation in. You got to be able to buy the material so when the lender comes back, he disperses you the money mm -hmm. to keep you going. So that's one way. So you still going to, but you still need money. You either yeah. need a credit card or you got to have some source of, equity somewhere mm -hmm. to pay um, for the project yeah or you can again you can partner up like i've done that before and i tell people to do that all the time it's like find a guy that wants to invest the money but don't want to do no work yeah so it's like i'm gonna be i do all the construction mm -hmm. you take care of the money gotcha. you know th so that's one way you do it but that's kind of the 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 way into no money down i think in this climate you have to have some, you skin know, in the game. skin in the game. Most lenders are. For the past two or three years, no, not really, because, you know, the market was crazy. You yeah. find the right deal. You're, and and, and, and that's go. another thing. You find the right deal, the money's going to come. Facts. I will say that, yeah. I, you know. But it, it, if you, people will be, you know, tripping over each other to give you the money if the mm -hmm. deal's right. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's kind of my thought on, you know, 
getting into it with no money. But you got to have experience too. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, you can't just, it can't be somebody that works, that's never did a flip yeah. and then wants to get into it and just no money down. Yeah. If you're a real estate agent and you know how it works, of course you can get involved. So it's all yeah. about who you put yourself around in, in the relationships you have. No, so it kind of, the question kind of leads to this. Yeah, you can't do this without no knowledge, but you can do, can I do a deal right now? Can I go find a lender that's going to give me all the money? Because I, you know, I might be tight on cash and I can get in. Yes, but I have a, I have a reputation behind it. Mm. So that's kind of my equity. You know, that's yeah. my money. I think that's where I fell yeah. into place when I did my mm -hmm. first flip, flip. It was more so like I had a reputation, but I also surrounded myself with people that um, were do was doing things. So yeah. I actually watched people from a distance, yeah. but asked questions. But at the same time, people knew, like, they know, like, all right, when Sadiq is about his business, he's about his business, yes. you know? So I totally understand what you're saying in terms of that. I, the one th key thing that caught my attention the one quote that you, that you mentioned that I thought was dope is that you say, don't let your ambition um, exceed your skills. Mm -hmm. And I think that that quote is dope right there because some of us could, could be a, too ambitious. Sometimes I could be too ambitious at times. All of us. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, we just all, a lot of us have dreams. And, like, I've never heard it stated like that before. And I think that's just the way you just laid that out like that. I think that was dope. Um, that was from a movie. A movie. And I was and I was locked up with him too. What movie? That was from um, Johnny Depp played the movie. What was the What was the guy's name? I just caught a blank. Uh, Jung was his last name. Oh, uh, Blow. 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 Yeah. That's classic where, movie. That's where I got that movie because I seen the real guy in my face in the flesh. Yeah. Yeah. So it's once he said it, it made perfect sense. Yeah. You know. So. That's kind of like I didn't make that up, but once I heard that, that kind of stuck with me. Mm. Um, don't don't let your ambition exceed your talents, that, which we all, dope. especially when you're young. I don't care yeah. who you are, you're gonna be guilty of it. You're yeah. gonna have lost any thinking, where you just think about money, 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 and don't think about the tasks that bring the money. Because if mm. you focus on the task, the money comes. It has to come. Yeah, you get what I'm saying? No, definitely. So. No, I definitely, definitely get it. Uh, question, what does your current net worth of $10 million consist of? Well, I mean, again, when we, we talk about net worth, we said in the beginning, like, that can fluctuate at any moment. But for the most part, all my net worth consider, consists of all my real estate holdings um, within uh, numerous companies that I'm part of, Kyle Tiff being just me, but I also have... Um, you know, about five other companies. Nice. I have companies with, uh, you know, multiple partners. I have companies with another partner, you know, so that's just a consist of all my real estate holdings and also a lot of the developments I have that I'm actually working on as well. How long did it take you to build such a powerful portfolio and what steps can someone who's looking to tap into this um, take to get there as well? Well, you you gotta have grit. You gotta have you know no quit in you at all. Yeah. You know because this is this is this this and and I think all business, not just the real estate industry. I think you're gonna be tested. You know I I tell people all the time, success comes, true success comes after a test. Mm -hmm. Nothing just happens. And even if it did just happen, eventually you're gonna be tested. So I just think those are the key things you gotta have. You gotta have like I tell people all the time, I'm too stupid to quit. You know, it's just not who I am. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just grind and have all the grit in the world to keep going. And I only, you know, I'm going to keep learning. You only know what you know. Fact. You know, I'm not the, the smartest dude in the book. You know, some people can talk to me and I could be literally be in a room and be like, what? you got to explain this to me like in layman terms because <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And, I, and I'm humble enough and I'm okay with saying that. I don't, I'm not fearful. Or like, they're not going to know that I don't know what this word means yeah. or whatever, or what this term, financial term means. I yeah. don't care about that. Explain it to me. Yeah. So um, you, you, I think that that's the key. And you, you got to be, you got to have that ambition as well, too. Mm -hmm. As much as I just said, don't let it exceed your talent, but you got to have ambition. And for the most part, you got to believe, man. Yeah. You, you know? got to believe in yourself. 
as as a I think I read a book was it as a man think of you know you you got to believe like if you really think um you're going to have one of these skyscrapers downtown mm. you got to believe it yeah you got to believe it there's no there's no question it like I right, didn't work today let's get up let's do it again yeah you know cuz I I've learned that when I was younger in the streets I've never seen nobody ever with the exception of going to jail or something yeah. I've never seen nobody ever quit in the street like if, if the work wasn't right they went and got some more work yeah you get what i'm saying nah, like facts. you know that work has to continue yeah they, they're going to, so i wasn't around people that quit as i've seen more people quit when they try to come to the um other side of legit world than anything but like nobody quits in, yeah. in the street you know even yeah. if even if it's a you know a regular fist fight a lot of times maybe i've seen people fight somebody 15 times and get beat up 14 yeah. you get what i'm saying so <laughs> But they just just how you was raised. So I take that same attitude and just keep going and keep moving, you know, and and, in my life overall. Um, So, you know, that's kind of what I would say is the most important thing. Just to keep showing up, man. Just keep moving and keep showing up. Um, Can you share some of your, can you share some details about the current projects you're involved in? Um, and what are your ongoing strategies and plans to expand on your real estate portfolio moving forward into the future? So currently, I'm I'm completing a 28 unit development. Um, oh. um, I'm working on about between stuff that I own and stuff that uh, my contracting company is working on. I'm working on probably about you know 20 projects right now. Um, I have a development that I just got approved for 16 units. Mm-hmm. I'm waiting for final approval. That was preliminary approval. And then I'm also working on um, another 42 units, possibly wow. getting that approved. So congratulations on that, man. That's what's up, man. This is like, y'all, I would love to get to that level of uh, investments and building uh, on, on a massive portfolio to that level and a lot of that takes years to even do and you've been in the mm-hmm. game for quite some time uh just doing this and most people think that's an overnight success like nah man real estate is like a straight grind a straight hustle and that shit ain't no overnight success by any means necessary you know um when someone earns money from their first real estate investment should they reinvest that money into another transaction immediately or what what do you think they should do with that money well so it is 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 two things so i i i've learned the hard way as far as that goes so if you just if you're in the flip business and that's all you do is flip right mm-hmm. a lot of times like for me from my experiences there's been times like i would flip houses uh, but that would be my only income source then the money I made, I either had to catch up on my bills. Mm. So then, like I would, I, so I catch up on my bills, and I take the money that I originally reinvested. Then I go do it again. Yep. But then I'm catching up on my bills. So now it became a paycheck to paycheck, yeah. flip to flip. But I, I will say this: if you could have different sources of income while you're flipping, while you're flipping, I don't, you know, whether if you have a full time career, um, you have rentals and stuff like that. When you do flip a house and you make some money that just becomes your true investment. So mm-hmm. now you can just double down on something else, you know, to continue on working on that, you know, that, that money. Um, so if you put up 50 and you made a hundred, yeah, keep it going. You gotcha. know, that's, that's, that's what I would say, but it's not, don't, don't have it. Whereas like, I, I made a hundred, let me go buy this or buy that, which we all do. Yeah. Um, but you got to be careful of it. Yeah. So absolutely. You got I'm all about stepping up. Oh. You know, I'm all about like if if I'm if I'm building, and that's one reason like I I'm doing 28 units. Now it's like I I I have to do more than that. You know, um, but that's just my position. Everybody else's position could be different, but that's what I believe. That you got to keep stepping up and challenging yourself to do bigger things in order to survive for the long term. Gotcha. Now here's a here's an important question for me, right? Is it advisable for individuals to be concerned when it comes to over leveraging themselves in the real estate industry? Absolutely. You could you you again if you don't have those other sources of income. Yeah. Um, 
you can over leverage yourself because now when you try to expand, if things don't go like perfect, yeah. you can get stuck with stuff. So now like if I'm doing three flips, just mm -hmm. example is, and they're not all done where I can sell them right away or yeah. one ain't selling, but you're working on it, you're going to get strapped for cash. Mm -hmm. But if you have other things that you're working on that make you money, yeah. it's not, it takes off a, a big burden where you don't over leverage yourself as much because at least you know, I right, this can take care of this or this can pay for this. So yeah. like for me, my, you know, my rentals pay for my lifestyle. My um, general contracting is, is the oil for the machine for the company, mm -hmm. which allows me to buy more flips, which the flips allow me to buy more rentals. Interesting. You get what I'm saying? So, so that's your business model right there. Yeah, I Pretty just much. I just go full circle with it. Wow. Well, because I, I needed something that can give me cash flow. That's yep. another thing. If you have no cash flow, you know, you could you can find yourself in a tough, tough position. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you know, there's certain guys that can do one flip at a time and they kinda can keep it going. But mm -hmm. for the most part, if you're making this if you're in a real estate business, my I believe you gotta have you gotta wear many hats within real estate. Nah, I truly I <laughs> realized that too. You know, so I realized that, man. I'm like, sheesh. It's, like I didn't realize like when I first came into the industry, like as a realtor, I just thought real being a realtor is what it is, right? But then if you want if you want to go far in this career, you really have to understand real estate on a massive level. Mm-hmm. You know, on the macro level versus the micro level. Yeah. Because if you don't understand real estate on a macro level, it's like, all right, how do you really um, leverage the opportunity to actually succeed in the game of real estate? You know what I mean? So wearing many hats and understanding different aspects. Obviously, you're not going to do everything in the real estate game, mm -hmm. but just understanding as many unique parts of the real estate industry that you can actually maybe do is going to be a key, I feel like it might be a key uh, key factor in surviving the game. Yes. You know, but that's just me personally. And I actually like how you hit down the money because you do have to wear many hats if you're trying to su survive in this industry and go from there. Um, what, are the three what are three considerations, right, that aspiring investors should be aware of when um, embarking on the on this real estate journey of this do you think Re rephrase that again sorry. what are three key considerations that aspiring investors should be aware of when embarking on a real estate project um be having patience mm. you definitely need patience um and it goes back to the cash flow and just don't don't count your money as you're doing something. You get what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Don't. A lot of times, everybody focuses on what they make, what they're going to make mm -hmm. during the whole process, which makes you miss, again, miss certain things because you're, you're focused on just money, 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 and you're not focused on your project. Gotcha. But when you focus on your project, it allows you to see everything that, that is not right and to get it right. And then you just let the money fall in its place. You know, you make your money off your purchase, not your not not when you sell it. So the the due diligence you do in the beginning is gonna help you in the end. So then you're just like, I right, I'm not even gonna worry about that. Yep. And then a lot of times it's I, I I look at margins, you know, what is the return on what I'm putting up? You know, if I'm if I'm putting up, you know, Overall, with my payments, my closing costs, my construction, if I put up a total of 40000 right, and I go through the whole process and pay my thing and it sells, and I walk out the closing with my forty and my tw and 20000 yeah. I made a 50% return on my money. Mm. There'd be a lot of people that complain, oh, I did all that for 20000 No, you made 50% return on your money, you mm. know, so... That's that's kind of how I and I don't I don't I don't I try not to have expectations of of um, of the the end result all the time because that's when you get disappointed. Gotcha. A lot of people was making you know hundred thousand hundred and fifty thousand. I've had conversations with people 
I'm not doing nothing less than forty thousand. I'm like, why not? I hear a lot of people. I hear certain investors who talk like that who say yeah. like, nah. If I'm not making a certain amount, I'm not taking a project. Do you, Do you think that's wise? In my opinion, it ain't. But I mean, everybody. Else, but again, it depends on you know, what you're doing. What What else you're doing? You yeah. get what I'm saying? Yeah. If my money's working for me, I want my money continuing on working. I don't yeah. care. As long as I ain't lose, yeah. if I got my money back and some money back on top of my money, I'm happy because I'm yeah. just going to do it again. Facts. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to do, and I haven't done it, but I've always, my goal has always been 52 flips in 52 weeks. Sheesh. You 52 get what flips in 52 weeks? Yeah. One way or another. Damn. Wholesaling, um, fix and flip, you know, whatever way I got to, new construction, if I could do 52 of them. Mm -hmm. If ten of them, I lose, I still win. Yeah. You know, I'm. For me, business is almost like a sport. You know what I'm saying? Like, and and the thing about real estate, as you get older, you get smarter. Mm -hmm. You know, when you play a sport, as you get older, you get you yeah. get weaker, you get slower. Yeah. We get smarter. Yeah. Because we're learning through the experiences. Exactly. So yeah. you know, I, I'm playing for the end of the the end of the season. There's going to be some years you don't make the playoffs. Some years you do make the playoffs. There's going to be a couple years you win the championship. So as long as I keep making the playoffs and I keep making money, mm -hmm. I don't concern myself. I look at it as a, as a whole, back row rather than micro. Mm -hmm. Certain deals are not going to have as much as me on the bone as the other one. Yeah. You know, so that's just, that's just me. That's how I look at things. Other people look at things differently. Um... And, and 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 again, everybody hustles differently. Mm -hmm. Everybody does business differently. There's certain things that work for you that's not going to work for me. Oh. You know, when I do, if I do a flip, I've had to learn over years, I'm not good at lipstick. Mm. I'm good at complete uh, yeah. gutting it and getting it done right. Yeah. Because every time it happens to me, it's like, oh, home inspection. I'm getting <laughs> tore up. And I'm just, now I'm sitting there pissed. Like, yeah. Yeah. So now to avoid that, Listen, I'm just going to rewire the house. I'm doing this. I'm doing yeah. that. I don't want to hear nothing that's yeah. brand new. But I know guys that are like, you know, I've had guys ask me for advice and tell me, I'd be like, listen, you're good at what you do. Yeah. Do what you do. Yeah. Because what I would do, it's not going to make sense for you. And that's how they made money. But they're good at that. They yeah. know, I, I, like, I know, um, I know uh, some mutual friend of ours, wife, right? Mm -hmm. Wife without saying her name, right? I think she's the dopest lipstick flipper. <laughs> like, I've seen her do stuff with kitchen cabinets yeah. and paint a different color and change the hardware and this and that and paint this color and oh, you you shouldn't have to take out that. I would like, I would have <laughs> never thought about that. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And that works. That works for her. Yeah. You know. But so so like going back, so everybody works differently. Yeah. You know. So that that's that's how I, how I look at things. You know, we all can 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 make money in different ways of doing it. Nah, facts. But it's, it's, again, it just, it's simple, man. You just got to show up. Nah, that's true. Keep showing up. And keep doing it. And keep doing it. How does Vincent McMahon, I feel like your name almost sounds like a wrestler's name. Yeah, everybody says that. <laughs> he is. How, how does Vincent McMahon um, define success in his own terms? Uh, well, for, for one, happiness yeah. You know, that's being successful, you know. So, um, and as far as business goes, success for me, I would say, is just getting better. I have no simple way of, you know, saying what success is. It's just getting better. Mm -hmm. You know, once it's not about the money, it's not about the material things you have. It's about, you know, what brings you joy. Success for me is, you know, somebody that that if I can help somebody like I love if I can help somebody get into the real estate and they succeed. Like I have friends that I was begging them to get into it. Right. And mm. when they finally got into it, man, they smoked me through the water with flips. Yeah. And I was happy about that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that's success for me. That's part that's of all right, that's part of my purpose. Mm -hmm. My purpose is to help people get to a change point in their life. Yeah. Whether if the change is. You you building some wealth, you learning something else, you know you 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 being able to get into this and take care of your family. Like I'm happy for you, mm -hmm. 
you know, that's that for me is success for me personally is helping other people. You know, it's not all about money, but, you know, there's an old saying, man, you want to make money, you got to help somebody else make money. Facts. You know, yeah. comes right back to you. So that's that's my version of success. That's amazing. You guys hear from, you guys hear the man himself, Vincent, man, Vincent, if anybody needs to reach out to you or, or connect with you, what's the best way they could do that? Well, obviously, they can hit me up on Instagram, which is uh, Kyle Tiff Holmes. Um, my email address is uh, vman at kyletiff.com. So that's V as in Vincent, M-A-N-N, at K-Y-L-T-I-F-F dot com. Um, so those are the best ways to get in touch with me. Amazing. And you guys know who this. It's your boy, Sadiq. Sadiq Davies at that. Um, if you guys are looking to follow me, follow me, follow me on my Instagram, Sadiq Davies, S A D I Q D A V I E S. And also you can follow the network.co. That's T H E N E T W R K dot C O meaning community, you know, because that's what the network's all about. It's a community of individuals that's doing great stuff and who's looking to share knowledge and their expertise and also their highs, their lows, the success and the failures. You know, follow me. Let's go.